50 years ago, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin blasted off to the moon in July of 1969. They landed on the moon, and I was watching the whole thing, what they could put on television. They had the cameras inside the, uh, the module as they were coming down to the moon. And I remember watching it very carefully. And it was July the 20th when they actually did land. I watched them when they blasted off on July the 16th. I remember that morning very, very well. And before Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin stepped on the moon, it was I think it was after midnight. I remember that very carefully. Did you know they left over $50,000 worth of equipment up there? At least that's what they reported at the time. I wonder how much that would be today. It'd be a lot of money. The uh, Apollo 11 mission uh, cost them $350 million for that one space mission. $350 million. And I wonder how much that would be in today's dollars. A lot of money. From Apollo 1 all the way up into uh, Apollo 11, uh, NASA spent, or actually America, spent $24 billion. And that was back in 1960s dollars. A dollar would buy you a lot of gasoline that day. In fact, uh, gasoline didn't even go up to 50 cents a gallon until 1973, not around here anyway. So, 69, what was gas at that time? Around 30 cents a gallon, something like that for regular? So, imagine how much that would cost today. Now, they're planning in a few years to go back to the moon. And, uh, boy, it's going to be very, very, very expensive this time if they do go back. And they're talking about doing that in the next few years. Well, it would be very interesting to watch them do that. What's that got to do with anything, though, by the way? Fifty years ago, man went to the moon. Half a century ago. And what did it actually accomplish? Well, it helped our technology. We were able to get satellites up and the Hubble Space Telescope. We've got GPS now where people can take the telephone. And that's good and that's well and fine. And I'm glad for all that, for all those of you who have the smartphones and the GPS. So our, our NASA technology has benefited us from somewhat. But going to the moon, oh, I, I, I really enjoyed it as a kid watching that happen. I was a teenager. I really enjoyed it. But what did it really do for anybody? We brought back 130 pounds worth of rocks. That's, at least that's what they reported at that time. They were planning to bring back 130 pounds of rocks. I guess they did. I went to the Smithsonian Institution a few years back, and they've actually got a moon rock in there when you go into the Space Museum. Uh, what they call the Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. There's a rock there that you can walk up and touch, put your finger on it. It's there for anybody to touch. It's a moon rock. So I've actually touched a moon rock, as thousands and thousands of other people have who've gone through that museum and touched one of those rocks. But I don't know what they did with all the other rocks. They looked at them, examined them. They're probably somewhere, maybe somewhere else in that museum, behind a glass uh, case or something. But they do have one out there that you can just reach up and touch. So that's nice, and so on. What's that got to do, though, with you? Going to the moon. Maybe they're going to go again in a few years. But unless you yourself are going, what's that got to do with you? You know, since around that time, as a teenager, I have reread, read and reread the Bible, the Holy Bible, through several times. I don't know how many times. Did you know that the Holy Bible, which is the inspired, plenarily inspired word of Almighty God, the Creator, did you know that, that in that Bible it says that God wants us to inherit all things? Look at Hebrews. Look at the first two chapters of Hebrews especially. It says that God wants us to inherit all things and that God ultimately plans for everything that he made to be under man. Now, as human beings, we're not going to go to the out, outer reaches of the galaxy. It's just not going to happen. They're light years away. We can't go the speed of light. About the fastest so far I think we've been able to go is about the escape velocity of the Earth, which is 25,000 miles an hour. That's about, I don't know, it wasn't much faster than that when they went to the moon, if it was any faster than that. So it would take us a long, long time to even get to our nearest star. And you know what we're going to find out there? If we ever do send a spacecraft out to Alpha Centauri, if we ever do, you know what they're going to find? The same thing they would find on the planets around our sun, like Mars, desolate, deserts, lifeless rocks floating around in space. 
The Bible therefore strongly intimates there is no life anywhere else in the entire universe, just us. You say, well, how do you get that? Because read it there, I believe it's the second chapter of Hebrews. It says very plainly that everything that God made was made for mankind. So if there are Vulcans out there and, and uh, little green men and that type of thing, well, then we'd have to share the universe with them. But the Bible says it's all for us. Now, again, the Bible is God's word, not just what Paul wrote. It is actually inspired by God. Now, I'm not getting all the proof of that, which I've done many times. But I'm not going to do that today. But I've proved it over and over that the Bible is supernaturally inspired. And we're also told that when Jesus Christ left the earth, after he was uh, resurrected from the dead, he, God gave him a glorified body. That glorified body was no longer made out of flesh and blood. He was able to fly just like Superman. And as they were talking to him that last day, you'll read about it in the first chapter of Acts, he actually flew off of planet earth and went right into a cloud. Now, I've been in the clouds, I don't know how many times. Many of you have. Probably most of you listening have been in the clouds at some point in time. We've taken these 727s and Boeing 737s and so on. I've never yet been on a 747. But we've taken these huge jets, passenger jets, and we've flown from here to there. I've flown back and forth to Texas and Ohio. Uh, where else have I flown? I can't remember the different places. Plus, uh, I've just flown around here in the, in the area in a small airplane, in a small Cessna. I've done that. So, and been in the clouds, and been above the clouds. I've looked down on the clouds. Let me tell you, the only way you and I can get in the clouds today is we have to be in an airplane, or at least a helicopter, or a rocket ship, or something. But the Bible says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, we're told in the Bible, we're actually told this, that we're going to have a body like Jesus Christ. And he's got a glorified body. Now, he was able to fly right into the sky. One day you're going to be able to do that. Now, since God says that everything that he made was made for mankind, that means the whole universe. In fact, I think the Moffat Bible translates it that way. And there's another one I just read recently that translates it the same way. Everything in the universe was made for humankind. So think about all the billions upon billions of galaxies. And they used to say, and I don't know if they've changed it, that the average galaxy is about like the Milky Way with around 100 billion stars. Now lately I've been hearing some of these programs on television where they're saying maybe the, maybe the Milky Way galaxy is bigger than what we thought. It might not be 100 billion, it might be 200 billion. And one uh, science program I heard recently said maybe 300 billion. What does that tell you? Well, they just don't know, do they? But there's, but there's at least 100 billion stars, at least that many. <clears throat> and they used to say there were at least 100 billion galaxies. Now, the latest uh, that I've heard, and this came from Science News, which um, would give information and updated information about the universe, the galaxies, and so on, and astronomy and physics, which I'm, I'm a student of astrophysics. It, it, we now are being told by astronomers that <clears throat> There's quite a bit more than 100 billion galaxies. If each galaxy is the same size as our Milky Way, not each one, but the average galaxy is the size of the Milky Way, let's say it's 100 billion, we now know that there are right at 2 trillion galaxies. Now multiply that times 100 billion stars and figure out how many stars there are. That's, that's more than your calculator can handle. And God says he wants to give it all to us. But... Some of you listening are agnostics. Maybe you even go to church, but you're still not sure about a lot of this. Well, you know, I understand when a person can be skeptical. How do you know that Jesus even lived? People will ask that question. You talk about his resurrection or whatever. But how do you know there ever was such a man? I've got an article here that we give to our students. It's entitled, Jesus, Is He Really the Promised Messiah? Here's the proof. That's a pretty long title. If you'd like to have this, I'll send it to you free of charge. If you'll pick up the telephone and call me, get your pencil handy, write down this number I'm going to give you here. And when this program is off, call. If you get a busy signal, keep calling. I want you to have this. It shows you secular history that absolutely proves beyond any doubt 
that Jesus really did live. He really did live. From secular history, we get that information. Secular history. And there's also some information here from the Old Testament that points to Jesus of Nazareth as being the Messiah from the 70 weeks prophecy. That is one of the most fascinating things you'll ever read. And if you're a minister, a preacher, an evangelist, or whatever, you really should write for this because it'll help you when you're teaching people. When they say, well, how do you know Jesus is really the Messiah? And you can see the proof. In fact, if you understand the 70 weeks prophecy, it points to the exact year, the exact month, and the exact week when Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. Oh yeah, I have total confidence that the Bible is truly God's word. We use a prove all things um, approach at Ambassador Christian College. And we prove that there's a God. Scientifically, we prove that the Bible is inspired. We prove that Jesus is really who he said he was. And we keep, and that's just the first few lessons. We've got 36 lessons in our systematic theology course. And by the way, if you would like to come, we are an accredited uh, theological institution. You can get a degree in one year going two nights a week, Monday and Tuesday nights. And there is no math or science or English required. Uh, no uh, history or social stuff and all that, economics or whatever. We're not required to teach that by the state. The state of North Carolina says that a Bible college does not need to teach all those peripheral subjects. So if you'd like to get a college degree, not that you need the degree. A lot of you already have degrees. But I'll tell you one thing, and especially if you're involved in any kind of ministry, and even if you've already been to four years of seminary, you really should apply and come to Ambassador Christian College. I have people that, have, that they're, they're, they've got their bachelor's already from a four-year seminary. One fellow was going, and he was already in the master's program at a very reputable seminary. And I said, let me see how much you know about the Bible. And I asked him to explain the 70 weeks prophecy. You know, he told me they never even studied it. He couldn't witness to a Jewish person to prove that Jesus was the Messiah. Can you imagine that? And I said, listen, <clears throat> you ought to come and learn the Bible at Ambassador. We're non-denominational. He said, no, no, I'm getting my master's from such and such a reputable seminary. I said, yeah, but you don't know the Bible. Oh, dear, the stuff that they learn, Reformation theology, Martin Luther, John Calvin, uh, this and that council, this and that denominational thing, we don't get into any of that. It's all Bible. Bring your King James Version. It's all Bible. And in two nights a week, within you know nine typical nine-month uh, school year, you'll have your college degree the following May. You can graduate the next May. Now, here's the telephone number to call if you'd like to get this information on proving that Jesus is the Messiah. And also, if you'd like to come two nights a week, if you live out of the area, if you're listening to this over the Internet in another state, you can also take it online. You really can take it online. Now, we're offering a major scholarship, a major scholarship for people who enroll early. Call me now. Don't put this off. We start the last week of August, the last Monday night, the last week, Monday and Tuesday nights of August. We do that every year. So call this number right now. The number is 704-783-5012. And you'll be able to get me probably, if you do get an answering machine, be sure to spell out your street address. Make sure we have your name and zip code. And here's the telephone number. Once again, call any time today or any time this week during business hours. But you can also call today. Call right now. If you'll call right now when the program is over. 704. Now, this is free. There's no request for money uh, at all for this free literature, this lesson entitled about Jesus being the Messiah. The telephone number, once again, is 704 783 5012. Until next time, from Ambassador Christian College, this has been Keith Slough.